This is the Obscurity to Authority podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. Okay, and we're live. Thank you so much, Shane, for joining us today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Darren. Awesome. Yes, I'm here with, with my man, Shane Melanson. He's a real estate investor. He specializes in commercial real estate. I won't go too deep into what he does because I don't want to butcher it. Uh, that's his job for today. So Shane, why don't you give everyone a quick little introduction to who you are and what it is that you do before we get too deep here? Yeah, sure. So um, so I live in Calgary, Alberta. I'm actually just in my home office right now. Uh, so if you hear my, my kids walking around, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll know why. But um, I've uh, been investing in commercial real estate for probably 10 plus years now. Uh, I started off uh, investing in residential real estate, probably like most people, fixing and flipping homes. And um, I, uh, you know, I, we, we can kind of get into the, the transition from residential to commercial if you like, but uh, it, it was really a series of kind of fortunate events and meeting the right people and, uh, and really, you know, understanding what it was that, that I was after, which was, you know, creating passive income to um, never have to rely on a job. And so at age 29, uh, 28, 29, I can't remember the exact uh, time, I left uh, my job at Sun Life where I was a commercial underwriter and I went full time into uh, commercial real estate. And I was working with my father-in-law at the time. He showed me the ropes on how to raise money, how to find the right deals. And think of it like a three to four year unpaid internship where I was essentially uh, you know, tasked with finding value add opportunities. And so, yeah, that's, that's uh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. More, more people need to do that by the way, which is take that experience over money. Too many people are looking to get paid right away. Um, and they're taking that short term gain instead of that long term gain, which is where they should be aimed. But yeah, let's back that up a little bit. So there's a few things there. I mean, you did start in residential, uh, but yeah. even before that happened, were you doing that residential investing? while you were still working your underwriting job or did you quit that and go into residential first? Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll even kind of take you a little bit behind the scenes, if you will, in terms of where, where I kind of came from and then how I even got into residential and then, you know, sure. the transition, if you will. So I grew up in a small town, White Court, Alberta, um, and that is kind of between Edmonton and uh, Grand Prairie. And it's a small town, both my parents were teachers and uh, I remember I was going to university and I would come back during the summers and I'd build logging roads and worked on the rigs and did all that kind of manual labor. And, uh, you know, my dream was just to get a, an office job. That was kind of really what I was what I was after. Um, anyways, my first year back, my parents and I were approached by a gentleman in White Court with an investment opportunity. And so it was a very lucrative opportunity. My parents, uh, being teachers, thought this would be kind of their fast track to retirement right. and they had just paid off their house uh, and what they did, my dad, he uh, not wanting to miss out on an opportunity, remortgaged their house, took out $100,000, put it into this investment. Right. Everything I'd earned that summer, which is about 13000 plus or minus, uh, I put into the deal as well. Six months later, it's all gone. You know, my parents now are forced to work another 10 years and pay off that mortgage. Uh, for me, I had to get a job to go to university and, and kind of pay for my my education. But it really taught me some. Uh, well, first of all, it scared the hell out of me uh, in terms of investing and trusting people. So for the next four years, all I did is work. I mean, I had three or four jobs. I saved everything I could. And um, uh, about this time, I was just about graduating from university and I was living in my my best friend's basement. And, uh, you know, I was stacking money and I was, I didn't even trust banks. I, I had it in a safety deposit box. <laughs> so uh, anyways, um, my girlfriend was over at the time and she was four or five years older than me and more successful and hanging out with lots of kind of wealthy people like Calgary Flames and just bi business people, right? right. Anyway, she's like visiting and she's uh, walking by my two roommates and, to go to the basement suite where I was, was uh, living. And she just said, you know what? I got to go. I can't can't be here. And I didn't know what the hell she was talking about, but um, essentially she was embarrassed. And so she broke up with me and, you know, I was obviously pretty, um, uh, you know, 
saddened and depressed for a little bit. But uh, it, it kind of triggered in me that just saving money uh, wasn't going to get me to where I wanted, uh, which was, you know, having money in a bank or a, a safety deposit box. It, it really wasn't helping me. And so seeing what my my friend had, which was about four rental houses at the time, and he was a bartender. He wasn't really, you know, he didn't need an education. I, I decided to buy my first place, got a roommate, and then three months later, I started to fix and flip houses. And so that really kind of the trigger point for me, which was like this uh, real uh, almost embarrassment, if you will, of, of you know, having money, but but uh, not not being successful. And so that was uh, a key driver for me to kind of pursue real estate investing. So that, that's how I got it. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And, and all of that you also did cover because I just finished your book. Uh, I guess it was a couple of days ago now. All that you cover in your book, which we will link to uh, later on, which is called what again? Club Syndication. Right. And they can get that from where? Your website? Yeah, they can just, you know, they can go to my website at shanemelanson.com or they can even just go to Club Syndication and download a free copy of it. So, yeah. So yeah. I, I highly recommend if you guys are interested in that story, getting that and reading through it because he goes into detail there. Um, and, and there's a lot of great points made, by the way, going back to that whole initial uh, right to the beginnings. That's interesting where your, your dad got into that investment. You guys got into that investment. Um, I think that was a great learning lesson as well because I still see a lot of that going on today and I think that can in large part be attributed to investing in things you don't fully understand or you don't at least have an idea of the risk involved. So how do you mitigate that today? Like, Do you still have you – know, is that something that you try to educate people on or do you ever see suspicion when you're getting into deals with others or maybe they've been burned before? How do you go into these deals making sure that you're not going to get burned? Yeah. Uh, no, that, that, that's a fair question. I um, So – Investing in commercial real estate and residential real estate, I, I view them as completely different. Right. Commercial real estate is like going into the NFL and residential, um, and it's not to diminish it. It's just yeah. you're just playing with people that, I mean, if, if a guy's worth a billion dollars or a couple hundred right. million and he's just at a different level, right. um, there's just a different rule book, if you will. And, and the second thing is the brokers, and I was a, a real estate agent, commercial real estate agent, so this isn't uh, anything negative towards them, but their job is really tough. And their job is just to make sure the deal stays together. And so they're pushing on both sides. And what I've seen is people that come in with very little experience, let's say a new investor, if they don't have someone on their side, if you will, to kind of walk them through the mistakes that can happen or just understanding you know, what to expect in a negotiation, uh, what happens is sometimes they either invest in the wrong deal, uh, they overpay, they buy the wrong location. I mean, there's just so many variables, if you will. And, you know, this this really became evident when I helped um, a doctor, uh, and I think I mentioned uh, this gentleman in my book as well, uh, where he had invested in residential real estate and he kind of felt that it had created a second job for him. And that really, that wasn't his intention, right? He wanted to replace his income as a doctor. And so when he came to me, we went and had a coffee, uh, him and his wife, and we sat down and started talking about commercial real estate. And I could tell that even just some of the terms, because um, it wasn't, uh, sometimes you just do things on it, like, unintentionally and you're not even aware of it. And so I was throwing out like acronyms like NOI and cap rates and, right. you know, DCR. And, 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 and I could, I could tell that he was like either, uh, confused, like he, he understood some of them, but I, I realized that I had to kind of like take a step back and say, okay, well, you know, what is it that you're looking to do? And, uh, and, and so there's a real education process, if you will. And so we, we spent probably the first two months just giving him the lay of the land. Hmm. Here's, the Calgary market. Here's the different asset classes, right? Do you want apartment buildings? Do you want value add? Do you want retail, industrial? Here's the pros and cons. And so we did that. And then uh, probably another two months to actually find some properties, put it under contract. And uh, at the end of the day, he kind of decided to go with uh, a property that was very, um, I'll use the word vanilla, like just great location, not a lot of value add, but he doesn't have to think about it. An hour a month, and now he's getting, you know, sixty five hundred bucks a month plus seven or eight thousand dollars in mortgage pay down every month. So it's you know, it's not it's not replacing his income, but you know, one property would be the equivalent of I don't know fifty or sixty homes. So right. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, that's that, that's amazing, and I think that that's that's really interesting because 
what I'm curious about too, I mean, the whole theme of this podcast we'd like to cover too is that whole journey from obscurity to authority and how do you go from nothing to something? There's a lot of ways to do that, uh, but it all comes down to two pieces. You need to find one way to build active income successfully, and then you can find a way to take that active income and invest it and create some sort of passive income. Uh, for sure. That's ultimately where your wealth's going to be built. If you have to work for every dollar forever, it's going to be a long journey to wealth. Um, and so that's interesting that you chose real estate because it's that perfect vehicle. Was there any other vehicles before you got into real estate that you had dabbled in or you had tested or you kind of, you know, should I go into stocks? Should I go into day trading? Should I go into options? Should I go in? Was there anything else on your mind before that you tried or thought of? Oh, yeah. I mean, I probably like a lot of people, I, I tried currency trading. Um, you know, I had a bunch of friends that were in uh, oil and gas. And so they would give me tips on companies and IPOs and and so generally what happened is I would put my money into these deals and I had zero control and sometimes they worked out, but like nine times out of 10, they didn't. And so it was just a frustrating process for me. And so, you know, my, my mentor, my father-in-law, he made a comment. He's like, uh, we're, we, we were having, um, uh, drinks in Kelowna with some other investors and they were talking about all these kind of, you know, really crazy cryptocurrency and uh and cannabis stocks and whatnot and uh i just i was just listening and he could tell that i wasn't engaged and uh he just made a comment he's like shane you're gonna get wealthy 10 percent at a time meaning the deals that i look at are things that i control things i understand i'm not gonna take flyers on deals because frankly it's just for every one of those that pop and that's what everybody talks about they, don't, they never talk about the 50 deals that they just got burned on and, and doesn't make up for it. Now, that this is just my philosophy, right? Everyone has their own. I mean, I've had conversations with guys that are all in on Bitcoin or huge into cannabis because it's a growing. And if they understand it and have taken the time to really yeah, yeah. know the risks and rewards, by all means. But for me, I've got a like my podcast, right? The uh, investing advantage. For me, my advantage is commercial real estate, value add. I know the game, I know the tenants, I know the, you know, how to, how to create value. And so for me to dabble in other areas, uh, it's just a distraction, so. No, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic point, because I think we have, a, we have a good mix of listeners here from, I mean, young entrepreneurs that are starting up to some of the older, more mature business owners and investors. Um, and I think it's a great point, because I've always believed in that. I believe like, don't invest or go into business in things you don't understand or control. If you're just doing it because it's, even if it is a great opportunity, it doesn't matter because you don't understand it, right? And there's huge risk in that. So I've always believed like, I don't enter a market, an investment, a business, unless I understand where my leverage lies. Like what, what gives me some sort of leverage in that, that, that gives me an advantage right up front. Um, yeah. And I look for that. And it's the same thing in, in my businesses, right? And I had mentioned yeah. to you like a strategy that I, I wanted to uh, employ with commercial real estate, which was almost flipping businesses, like buying the commercial real estate with the businesses. And that's because I have a marketing agency. Like I'm confident yeah. with our, our systems of operations and marketing. I could go in, I could turn around a local business. I could bring up the operating income of that business. And there's, I would do that because that's unique to me, not because someone brought me this opportunity and says here, so you can make a lot of money. Irrelevant, right? I have no leverage. There's nothing that makes me unique. Um, and I don't understand it and I don't control it. And so I'm the same way. Like I, I dabbled in stocks before I've dabbled in options. I've, I mean, I bought precious metals, which are still pretty cool, but I've done all that. I've looked at the Bitcoin stuff. I've looked at the, the marijuana stocks. I've done, I've done all of that stuff and none of it's ever got me anywhere. The only thing that's had me staying power lately uh, was our family getting into real estate. And it's because we took the time to learn, do it slowly, do one at a time, get to know the markets, the people, the groups, the investors slowly. And then once you get into that, you see it start building. And it's exactly, that was the best way to put it. It's 10% at a time. There was no yeah. one thing we went in, put money down and we're wealthy. It was little yeah. by little by, and it still continues to be that. So I totally agree yeah. with that. That's a great point. Yeah. It, it, just as you were talking, it, it kind of made me think of, um, uh, well, there's a few points that, that you brought up there. But um, uh, let me just think here. So you buying businesses, if you will, and then the, real, the underlying real estate underneath. I mean, uh, so I had two resorts in Ontario, just north of where you're at, right, in, in Muskoka. Uh, one just south of uh, Gravenhurst called Shamrock Bay, and then the other one just north of Bracebridge, just by the golf course there, which was 100 acres. And that, uh, those deals taught me a tremendous amount. 
But the biggest thing that I kind of brought away from that, or one of the biggest things, was just understanding marketing and sales and cash flow. And um, so when I do developments now, most developers that I've worked with, they come up with a concept and then they go to the market and try to sell it. Where I take an, a different approach, probably somewhat to, like yourself, where I want to know what the market wants. I create something, I show it to the market, I get feedback, and then I modify it. And so the last two deals I did, uh, this is one that uh, I think Erwin and I talked a little bit about, and he, he found it pretty interesting. So we did uh, 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 industrial condos. So basically think of it like uh, residential condos, except they're for industrial, small bay industrial warehouses. Yep. And our agents brought us the deal and they said, you know, buy these this 2.9 acres of industrial land and we can sell these industrial condos because there's a tremendous demand. And I said, okay, well, tell you what, um, I, I like the concept and the idea, but I don't want to risk, in this case, it was about $9 million, wow. uh, to, to find out whether or not your, your assumption is correct. So I said, I'll risk $50,000, and that's kind of the amount of money that I needed to put plans together, talk to architects and whatnot. And I said, I need four months to go to the market and find out what the market wants. And so for four months, we designed it, went to the market, talked to buyers, well, I like this, I don't like this. And we probably changed our site plan, which is kind of like what it's going to look like, six times. And it wasn't until we had 70% pre-sales that we actually pulled the trigger on the land. And so by the time that I removed conditions, meaning my money was at risk, I had 70% pre-sales. And so if that's all I got, I would be break even. And then by the time we actually closed on the land, which was about 30 days later, uh, we had it 100% sold out. And so at that point, our risk was execution. And we already had a fixed price contract and we had, you know, a lot of the pieces in place. So to your point, that's my advantage, right? I understand marketing and stuff. I understand how to take risk out of a deal. And so, you know, guys like Grant Cardone, they view development as very risky. And I suppose for him, it is risky because he may not be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But if you understand development, like I've seen some of the biggest guys in Canada and the U.S. do, they take a lot of that risk out of the deal. Right. I mean, if you're building on spec, absolutely, extremely risky. But if you've got tenants in place, you can pull a lot of that risk out and, and really experience you know, upside. So anyway. How, how do you feel about that, the whole Grant Cardone thing? I mean... Um, I, I used to be a pretty big fan, but I'm looking at what he's doing with real estate and maybe I just don't know enough about it, but do you think it's a good idea that people are just sending their money um, to someone they've never talked to, never spoken to, and betting on deals, having no idea how he's running them? Is that really the best way to go about it? Um, you know, I, I have to preface it by saying I don't mm -hmm. fully know how he's doing it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a fund, meaning you're putting money in and then he's able to put it into multiple deals or if it's one-off deals, no, it's right? exactly that. It's, it's a fund with multiple properties. They're okay. raising money over the phone with a sales team. He raises yeah. about, I think he said 12 million a day comes through over the phone. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, <laughs> look, it, he's, he, he's doing the same things that, uh, that most of the big, you know, the Blackstones and these, yeah. these, you know, massive REITs are doing. And essentially what he's trying to do is he's getting, try to, trying to get his cost of capital as low as possible. Right right? Meaning when I go out and raise money, um, typically my investors want to know that they're going to get above average returns, right? So they want to see, you know, on a development deal, they're looking for like 20% returns plus because there's more risk. Now, if I'm just going out and buying like, like, so Grant, he really focuses on like core properties, a locations where over five, 10 years, the rents are going to continue to grow, right? And, and the, and the theory is that if you have uh, the best in class and you're in growing markets that you're going to continue to get that that um, that push on rents if you will, right and look I mean he, he's super successful so I get why why people are drawn to him and, and put money in right I mean I, I follow a lot of his stuff I uh, I've studied him and for me it's not I mean uh, okay I'll, I'll, uh, this is the way I view commercial real estate because I think that there's three different buckets. Mm -hmm. There's people looking to grow their money. There's people that are uh, trying to make money, grow money, and 
keep their money. And keep their money is like legacy, right? You're, you're, that's what Grant is doing, essentially, right? A lot of the wealthy families that I'm aware of, they're buying with like 10, like most of them are buying for 50 and 100 year times. Like that, that's how they think. I would imagine, and I don't know this, but most people that I meet are either looking to grow their money, right? Like this doctor. He's got, let's just say it's a million dollars or 500,000 dollars. He knows that that's not enough to be able to retire on. So he's looking, saying like, I don't want to be too risky in terms of buying distressed assets, but if I can find either like value add or just core stable properties and I can put a couple of these things together, let's say in, I don't know, 10 years, I'm going to be in a position to replace my $500,000 or $300,000. Mm-hmm. And so uh, if you're looking to make money, right, these are the guys that are flipping houses, uh, wholesaling, finding distressed properties. Frankly, even when I do developments, I'm making money, right? right. Except I'm making it on a big scale, mm-hmm. right? Most of these deals are, you know, seven figures plus in terms of uh, uh, profit. So wow. I don't know if that's a question, but I, I kind of jumped yes. around. No, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the whole theme of this podcast. We're just going to jump around. Uh, me too. I get random ideas, and we're going to head in different directions. <laughs> but no, that, that does answer my question. And I mean, I'm going to kind of use this time selfishly too, because I have a bunch of questions that I think others sure. will find valuable. And yeah, yeah. one of them to me is, well, firstly, the whole reason I asked, I don't want to forget my first question, hopefully, but uh, one of the reasons I asked about Grant Cardone is like at least, I think now three people in the past two weeks have told me, have you heard of this Grant Cardone stuff? I want to invest in it. And I'm just like, if you're going to get into real estate, that doesn't, to me, sound like the best way to do it. And these are people that have no clue how real estate works. They've just heard Grant Cardone say he's making money and they're sending money to him. And I'm like, that's probably not a good idea. Um, that's why I asked. So hopefully that, that yeah, yeah. clarifies. So you, you did pretty well answer that. And I think it all goes back to no. The answer is you should probably learn the craft, learn the market, learn how it works. Even if you're going to be a passive investor, you should get some education on the market and the process. Don't just throw your money at people. Um, yeah. That's never smart. But my other question to you was was this, and this is kind of wrestle, I wrestle this in my own mind because a lot of times investors are taught um, different strategies, whether it's with residential or with commercial. And there's two kind of thoughts or streams of thought when you look at income from real estate investment. And that's the very active side, which, I mean, it could be the long-term buy and hold and managing that, but I consider it like the flips, the wholesale, the stuff where you're just, it's a one-time deal. You go in, you make your money, you get out. And then there's the right. one saying, well, if you really want to build wealth, it's the long term. You got to buy this stuff and you got to hold this stuff. So yeah. when you look at commercial real estate, and this is something I wrestle with. Like, I'll give you even an example so you can answer on that. There's a piece of land that just went up for sale here, uh, 10 minutes from my office. It's prime South Bay real estate. Um, it's about 0.64 acres, so just over half an acre. Um, they want about 795 for it, I believe. It's all still covered in trees. It is serviced. Now I look at that and I go, where's the What's zone? Uh, it's zoned for commercial. I don't know the exact. It just said zoned for commercial in the listing. Okay. Okay. So I look at that and I go, if I if I was getting into deal like that right now, I have a few options. Do I go in there? And, I mean, if the numbers made sense, do I go in there, buy that land, get it developed, clear it out, build something on it? Maybe we build commercial just just the envelope and we just sell the units as is and people finish in their own. Um, and I, I get in, I get out. Or do I buy it? Maybe move my office into one of them and lease out the rest. And how do you decide, well, what's what's the better route? Sure. So there's a couple of different things. Number one, I mean, so this would be like the first part, which would be like, what is it that you're trying to achieve, right? I mean, if, if you're trying to, um, if you've got uh, $10 million and you say, this is another core asset that we're going to hold and we're going to basically develop it, mm-hmm. we're going to put our offices in there, we'll lease out some other space, but we want to be here for 20 years, I mean, that, that, that's one approach. If you are saying, you know what, uh, I've got half a million dollars or a million dollars and I really want to like grow my wealth, then you could look at it and say, well, uh, uh, the first question I would ask is, do you want to own this for 20 years? Right. Because if, if like I've got a development right now in Southeast Calgary where it's not a core asset. And when I say a core asset, it's like, like I mean, I like it. And if I get anchor tenants that are credit worthy and they're going to be there for the next 20 years and I don't have to think about it, then I'll probably hold on to it, right? I'll develop it, I'll refinance, pull my capital back out and deploy it into the next project. However, if I get um, tenants that I am okay with, right? More mom and pop, 
um, not nationals. Right. I may look at it and say, you know what, the market's hot right now. This is an opportune time to sell because interest rates are low, values have never, gonna, have never been this high, so why not take my money off the table and sell it and then redeploy it into the next asset, right? So it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a hard question, but I really look at it like, do I want to hold it for five years or do I want to hold it for 50 years? Because commercial, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's not quick, right? Yeah. Uh, and before I forget, uh, your question on how to invest passively, if you will, because it sounds like some of these guys are, are investing yeah. passively yeah. in Grant. Um, and it's not just Grant, right? I mean, there's, there's lots of syndicators. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got people that come into my deals. Yeah. Um, one of the things I would say is, uh, even since I started to become a little bit more out of obscurity, right? right? In terms of doing podcasts, writing my book. Okay. I've had people contact me and say, hey, Shane, can I invest with you? And uh, I will tell you, uh, and, and this isn't out of a place of arrogance, it's just a really a place that, because I've done it, um, my business is in finding the best deals and then making sure that I've got good partners that are not going to, um, I, don't, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but like, <laughs> like, they're not going to be calling me every day saying, hey, Shane, what's going on and where's my money? And, right. So the the investors that I like, they're betting me just like I'm betting them. And so I would say that if it's really easy to put your money into a deal, I would be suspicious. A little bit. I, I would just I would ask the question like, I mean, is my money going in with smart money or is it my money going in with um, unsophisticated money? I don't know. Right. And I'm not making a comment as to how how that money's being raised. I'm just I, I mean, I did a. 80 minute conversation with a friend of mine who's looking to invest, not with Grant, but with a different syndicator. And he had about 15 questions. You know, how do you vet the sponsor, the deal, the, you know, like all these kind of, he, he really came in prepared. And I said, well, let's record it. And I'll send you a link if you want. You can, it, it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes really deep into how I think about investing if I was a passive investor because I've been on both sides. Where I've lost and obviously raised. So. Yeah, yeah. I think I think for those guys that are looking for passive, um, and a lot of those are the higher kind of net worth individuals or the higher income individuals that are busy. They're probably business owners, professionals, doctors, sure. lawyers. Um, that, I think that's definitely a great option. It's finding a guy like you who has that experience, who has those deals, um, and then taking the time to get educated, know know what it is that you do, how you do it, how you work, how you find deals, um, and then part of like that's the best way. I mean, that's a hundred percent. If if I was in that bucket, that's exactly what I would be doing. Um, it definitely would not be getting sent overseas on a phone call to Grant Cardone because I'm sure what he's doing is fantastic. That to me is no. I, I want to know who's dealing with the money, what their process is, where it's going. I want to. I want to be a part of it, um, at least in the beginning, not to bother them constantly, like you said, because you don't want those clients that I mean to put it unpolitely or just become a pain in the ass because we all deal with those. Um, we don't want that. But I'd, I'd want to be at least informed, educated, know who you are, be able to take you out for dinner, grab a drink, and and just yeah, yeah. feel like I'm part of it. Right. Yeah. That'd yeah. be a big point. But for those guys who want, so that, that makes sense before what you said about their, the, the two buckets is kind of like, um, do you want to hold it for five years or do you want to hold it for, for 20 or 30 or 40? Um, and also, are you trying to make income or are you just trying to kind of preserve and long term grow that income? So I think for me, and I think for a lot of the younger guys listening as well, it, it definitely is that grow. And I think the initial appeal to something like commercial real estate is like you said, it's those big numbers. It's can I go into this deal? And there is a really big upside. So why don't we speak to some of the guys that would be interested in getting into commercial real estate first on the, I think we'll end it with the passive side, but first on the active side, yeah. can we talk a little bit about that process and how someone, the average individual, maybe they're, they're 30 some years old, they have steady income, not a lot, maybe they make 80 to 120 grand a year, they wanna get into commercial real estate actively, look for these deals, find deals, raise money. What's kind of the process? And you can take your time on this, but if you wanna walk through, yeah. where would those guys start? So I, um, so like, there, there's different uh, thoughts on this, if you mm -hmm. will, right? Uh, and really, there's kind of three areas of, um, or three places that you really need to master, right? You got to find the right deals, you got to finance them, and then you got to be able to manage, fix them, operate them, whatever you want to call. Typically, the last piece, which is fixing properties, which is what I call it, mm -hmm. that can generally be outsourced. So really, then it comes down to finding money, and uh, finding the properties. Right. And so uh, I always start with finding the properties. Right. I like to be able to know that I can raise the equity because it does become a chicken and egg, right? I mean, 
you're not going to get a lot of people going out to find deals when they say, well, as soon as I find a deal, um, how am I going to raise the money, right? So what I would suggest in that case is to align yourself with someone that has experience in terms of have they syndicated deals before or, or do they have the capacity to be able to pull this off? Um, I would say, uh, are you in Barry or Aurelia or what, Barry, what's your yeah. – Barry, right. So I guarantee in Barry, there's probably like two or three guys that are invested in commercial real estate. If you talk to a few of the brokers, they're going to say these guys are always looking for deals. Right. Now, if you know who they are, you've had conversations with them, they may not even take your call initially because uh, – but it's not like they're celebrities either, right? And and a lot of these guys, if they – or girls or whoever it happens to be um, – they're, they're pretty keen on A, seeing new opportunities and seeing people that are hungry and aggressive. And so if I was starting out knowing what I know now, I would be mastering one asset class. It doesn't have to be multifamily. That's why I call it commercial real estate because quite frankly, most, most people focus on multifamily. Well, generally speaking, most apartments are bid up so high right now. Right. The caps are super low and there's so much competition so being a contrarian, I'm looking at retail. I mean, retail is just getting the shit kicked out of it right now by Amazon. But it doesn't mean that retail is going away. Right. And so I can go in and buy a retail property at a seven cap or a seven and a half cap in some places, right? I mean, not all, but it, it gives you some perspective. Um, so I'd be looking for opportunities where there's a value add and there's a story. I always call it a story, right? Like, like if I got to go and pitch this to someone, what's my narrative? What, how am I going to communicate this where I get their interest? And so if I've got that down and where it's really easy to explain, then I'm going to get their attention and probably be able to have a meeting with them. Hmm. I'm going to be smart. I'm not going to say too much because if they find out, you know, yeah. what the deal is, they might, go they might just that. go around. Me. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you have to be a little, yeah, that's what I mean, but you have to understand the game, right? Smart. But if you can find the right properties that have vacancy, under market rents, whatever it happens to be, and you can you can tie these properties up with a letter of intent without having to put money up. Now you're not going to get a ton of time, and you should have some money to be able to put it under contract. But at that point, now you can start going out and talking to partners and investors. Because I can tell you when you meet with a doctor or an engineer or some guy that's got a ton of money, maybe a business owner, you're not going to get a lot of uh their time if you're talking conceptually, right? I mean, hey, I'm thinking about this or think, you know, like it's like a property, I'll give you an example, right? Right now I've got a half acre, it's by a, a big school and I have just started to plant seeds with my investors. This is what I'm looking at guys, but you know what? Until I'm far enough into my due diligence uh, that I know I'm gonna do this deal, I don't wanna waste your time. But high level, how does this sound to you? Well, I like it. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, perfect. So I know that guy, he's worth whatever X dollars. He might put in 100, 200, whatever the number is. And so I can start to kind of piece those, you know, piece the deal together. And it, it's a process. I mean, it's uh, there's a bit of art, but certainly some science to it as well. That's interesting. So that your question? It does. So someone starting out, I mean, you're saying the most important part is get good at finding deals. Finding deals, finding a story behind those deals. And yeah. in large part, I mean, and this is something that I think Irwin's even told me about. When you find good deals, uh, money comes a lot easier because there's always guys with money. If, if it's there and it's real and it's actually tied, and you mentioned that in your book, like actually tied up, not just, hey, yeah. I found this cool property, like do you want in? Because the first thing they'll say is like, well, do you actually have any control over that right now? Because by the time I say yes, it could be sold, right? Yeah. Someone else could tie it up. So I, I think, so you're saying that would be the best kind of starting point is get good at finding those deals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, when you, so um, I just spoke last week an event with about 60 or 70 real estate investors that were trying to get into commercial real estate nice. and uh, there's about 10 people that stayed afterwards and there was one lady in particular and I just talked about this where she uh, she was she had come across and I don't want to give away too much of the details but kind of like a 30 to 40 unit apartment building um, she knew uh, the she had developed a very good relationship with the uh, owner and she was asking me a bunch of questions about how to partner up with someone right someone with the money and so when I started to kind of peel back the layers, uh, I, I found that she was really just looking to do like a one-off deal. She felt that there was going to be enough uh, upside in this that she would never have to partner up with this person again. It was like 
kind of like a one night stand, right? I mean, it was just like, there was no relationship. It was like, yeah. you bring in the money and expertise, I'll bring the deal, let's split the profits and we'll both walk away. And I just told her, I said, you know what? You're gonna find the wrong partner, in my experience. Because um, A, if you don't have experience and all you're doing is finding the deal, unfortunately, the cash is gonna dictate the terms. And so I've seen in many cases where an unsophisticated person brings in the deal, let's say they control it even, right? And I didn't go into this in the book because it starts to get kind of complicated, but so let's say you bring a deal to me, right? And you've got it under contract and you say, Shane, you've got the experience and all the money and, uh, and I shouldn't be using me because then I'm gonna associate this as, as me being unscrupulous. <laughs> I've seen examples where uh, this investor that's got the money and expertise they kind of string the, the person along, and then towards the end where you're getting close to closing, what happens is this person that just has found the deal, uh, they're very vulnerable because they only have one option, and that option is the person with the money. And if that person with the money changes their mind, then you're either losing the deal, you're having to basically, you know, you get squeezed out essentially, right? And so what I suggested to her is I said, like, look, develop like a real partnership, right? Come into this with a long-term vision of how are you going to work together? Because if the person comes in thinking that this is just like a one-off deal, yeah. I mean, everybody's trying to get everything, like that. they're both, both parties are going to try to get whatever they can out of the deal. And uh, unfortunately, the person with the money is going to really start to, to, to drive the decisions, if you will. So uh yourself with the right partner is is critical interesting okay yeah and I, I totally agree with that and i think that's another luckily i'm just thinking to myself again selfishly but that's where uh i think there's leverage like having this marketing company the cool thing is i have a lot of great partners a lot of great business owners i know what they make i know what their businesses do yeah. um, i know which ones are really busy and don't have time and i hear what they want to do so i, I think that, that's really cool too so if you can also that's another point like if real estate isn't your main business um, maybe you're someone who has another company, like a sales training company or a marketing company, and we saw that with Grant Cardone, his, his core business was, was sales, that you can then tie in and leverage to help find people with money and make partnerships and have relationships that then can bring into the real estate side. That, that's a good point too, because a lot of guys I know have a business right now. It's not that you have to, I don't think, kill that business. There's a lot of room to leverage that and bring that leverage into the real estate world as well. Yeah, well, I, I mean, most of the guys that I'm aware of here in Calgary and other markets I've invested in, whether it's Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, you know, they, uh, a lot of them are business owners, right? They own a car dealership, they own a manufacturing, whatever it happens to be. And so once they get enough cash flow that it doesn't make sense to put it back into their business, they say, where else can I put it? And so they start to invest in commercial real estate on the side because it doesn't take that much time, right? right? right. And, you know, if you're a, you know, car dealer or whatever, you kind of have a feel or a sense for what places you want to own. Right. And uh, and so you just start to acquire real estate. And at a certain point, it's like, like Grant. I mean, now all of a sudden, his assets over here are worth so much that his core business, that, but, but you have to remember, his core business fed right. all that, right? right? Without his, without over here making the millions of dollars a year to be able to buy that commercial real estate, it is very difficult. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's really smart to start now for you, for example. Yeah. Uh, but but don't kill the golden egg or the goose right. or whatever it is that whatever that saying is, right? Yeah, yeah. Whatever is generating your cash flow, just keep using it to to fund your deals. Exactly. So that's cool. So walk you through the process. I mean, so that first step is that. So get good at finding the deals, get some of the money, get the connections, get the network, make the partnerships. Great. We go out, we find a deal. Um, I like what you mentioned before. I want to learn a little bit more about that because I think it was interesting where you, sure. you eliminate the downside by doing things, like you said, pre-selling the majority of that building. So sure. explain to us, I think a lot of people heard you say that, but they don't understand what that means or how that's really done at a high level, of course. Uh, yeah. But let's say I find a property I'm about to buy um, or I'm going to tie up or I'm buying land to be developed. How are sure. you doing what you just said, which is getting already tenants in a building that you don't even own yet? Yeah. Um, okay, so so a few things. W one, I would say that um, I do developments now because I've got like 10 years of a track record and I've got a partner with 20 years that does development. Right. So for you or anybody else, I would say that getting into land development is Tricky. like on the spectrum of risk and, and time and expertise, it's like way over here, right? Yeah. 
But I think that if you were just to find a value add, right, a retail property, an office building, whatever it happens to be. So let's say you find it, you submit a letter of intent, an LOI, it gets accepted, and then you go to a purchase and sale agreement and you get the PSA, purchase and sale done. Now you're under contract, right? Now that's when your due diligence starts. Mm -hmm. So let's say in your case, maybe you get 45 days. Well, the first 15 days, I'm probably talking to every leasing agent out there and I've already, I've already, I already know who the leasing agents are, right? But now I'm talking to them, sitting down, having coffee, saying, "Hey, here's the building I have under contract, and it's got, I don't know, let's just say it's a twenty thousand square foot building, five thousand square feet are vacant. Yeah. I need to find either multiple tenants or one tenant to take that space, yeah. and I'm, and I'm asking them, like, let's go tour it. What, what do you think? You know, a, they should already know the building, right? And if they know the building, then it's like, oh, yeah, well, here's the problems. Ceiling's too low, not enough parking, access sucks, uh, visibility, whatever it happens to be, right? Okay, how do I – now, they're going to tell you all the reasons. They're going to, they're gonna, you know, shit all over the deal, essentially. Right. Or they might say, I love it, but there's a reason why it's vacant. And then it's your job as the investor to come up with creative ideas that someone hasn't seen to fix that problem. Right. right? And for you as a marketer, you can start to think, yeah. okay – Right. What, whatever it is that you're bringing the, the equation, that's your advantage. Right. What is it that, you know, doesn't. And sometimes it's what I call triangulating different conversations. So I'll talk to a mortgage broker. Oh, this is why it's vacant. This is what they, this is what the bank doesn't like. This is what the leasing agent says. Oh, you know what? This appraiser said this. Uh, the last guy that sold this property, he knows that. You know what I mean? So you're just like it takes time. Mm -hmm. But the reality like that's why doing one or two deals a year is all you need to do. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and so one of my biggest lessons, one of the things that I kind of took this from Grant is finding deals that are big enough mm -hmm. because if you find a deal and you put all this energy into, and I've done this in the past where it's got now half a million might sound like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it, it you know, it, it's not as much as you would think, right. Uh, especially if you have partners. Right. So I'm looking at deals that have like multiple million dollar, upside because if i'm going to invest all that energy then there's got to be that payoff right right because either way the energy has to go in that's right whether you do a one million or a ten million dollar deal the same amount of due diligence goes in the same amount of preparation and conversations with lawyers and all that kind of stuff so hmm. that's very good I, I like this and you're saying yeah like if you do a deal or two a year it's worth it so let's talk about that too like monetizing this because I, I know more about residential and i think a lot of people might have heard more about that so i don't know if it's similar here if you're doing a deal like you just said, like a value add, so I find I find a unit that's partially vacant. It probably has some issues, some things that we could do creatively to make it better. Um, and I do figure out what that is, and I do end up buying it. You know, where's the money being made? Because I know a lot of guys in the refinance world, they'll buy a house, for example, they'll do the value add of like adding a second suite. They'll refinance at the bank sure. because the value has gone up, and that's they'll take that out and keep the asset. Is that similar in yeah. commercial? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You would, you would, you would. Uh, deploy the same strategy, if you will, right? Um, in commercial, there's different avenues, money back, you know, people, but there's like floor ceiling or supplementary loans if you're in the US or, um, you know, blend and extend, but there's all these different ways that the bank will essentially give you additional equity or, or mortgage, if you will, to be able to pull and put into your next deal. Yeah, it's funny at eleven o'clock my time. I've got an interview with the gentleman uh, who is a mortgage broker, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So just you raising the point uh, will, will kind of trigger me to make sure that I, I have that discussion. So, yes. um, yeah, but but you know, if you add value, so let's say you buy a building that's worth five million mm -hmm. in eighteen months or two years, you raise the value to let's just say seven million. Yeah. You know, you can either sell it. But here, you don't in Canada, we don't do 1031s, right? So you can't okay. you can't roll your money into the next deal tax free. So what a lot of guys will do is they will basically refinance, likely what they put into the deal initially. So it's you know I'm not an accountant or tax expert, but they pull that money out tax free, and they put it into the next deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. So it's it's similar in a way to residential. So yeah, that that's probably <laughs> I would say, and I I'd agree. Is there any room usually in that? Well, I guess you just said there was, but to sell it, but there'd be no real benefit because you just get hit massively on the taxes. You know, look, I, like there's, uh, there's different philosophies that investors have. 
Some guys, they buy and they will never sell. Like they just hold it for forever, right? They pass it on to the kids and they've owned it for hundreds of years yeah. uh, or hundred years, whatever it happens to be. And, and uh, guys that are more transactional and they say, you know what? Um, like I took it from a million, it's worth two today. I'm never gonna go broke making a profit. And so uh, depending on what your uh, investing philosophy is, that's kind of number one. And then the other part is like markets go in cycles. And so if you're nearing the top and you've got 10 properties, let's say, and you see this with a lot of big companies, uh, you know, the real cans and the, you know, first capitals. And so maybe, maybe they ramp up and they buy a bunch of properties in, in times where the market is favorable for them. And then as they near the top, they look around and they say, you know what, we own a retail property in Aurelia. And that's not really a core market for us. We like Toronto, Montreal, uh, Vancouver, Calgary, whatever it happens to be. And so some of these properties that are either in secondary markets or not core assets, they cull them from their portfolio. Right? They sell them off. So let's. Yeah. Very so it's, interesting. It, yeah, it's it's you know when you study what the really successful like pension funds and REITs and, and like. They don't have podcasts. They don't talk about this. You have to like work with them and have conversations and go to events and network. And it's like, why are they selling that? What like why like what causes you guys to sell that property versus this property? Right? I was just looking at some retail deals in Lethbridge. Well, the reason that this particular massive company was selling it is because the lease for the Walmart was coming up. Right, and so they're saying we don't want to take that risk, but another investor can come in, and if they want to roll the dice, there's maybe upside, but obviously there's downside too. Interesting. Yeah, no, no, that's 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 very fascinating. So no, I, I appreciate that. Why don't we end this off too a little bit with uh, just a note on the passive side for anyone that is listening to this as well. Maybe they heard all that and go, well, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't have time for that. <laughs> what what's some of the options they could go forward with, and especially if they're with you? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, there's there's real estate syndicators. Essentially, a syndicator is just someone that pools money together and goes out and finds assets, right? Um, typically, the way I like to approach that, if you will, is that uh, if I'm a passive investor, I want to know that there's other smart money going into a deal, right? That's kind of one of the big things that I look for. Uh, so, for example, in my deals, I've got a lot of... Uh, you gotta be careful because I gotta keep them confidential. But uh, people that are in commercial real estate, even they say my job over here is in buying and selling, and as a as an agent or developer or whatever it happens to be. But I like what you're doing, Shane. So I'm gonna put money into your deals. And so they're like a second litmus test for me to make sure that the deals I'm doing are are vetted properly, if you will, right? Uh, so a I would find out kind of who else broadly speaking, is going to be coming into those deals. Um, what's the track record, obviously, of the person that you're dealing with? Um, I'm a big believer initially investing in your backyard. That's one place that I probably disagree with a lot of other um, uh, call it marketing or uh, real estate uh, gurus and, and people that coach and whatnot. They say, you know, and, and I do invest in other locations. It's just, it's much easier to manage something in your backyard, and it really is a business. So depending on the level of um, work that needs to be done, if it's a heavy value add, I look for partners in those locations uh, to, to invest with. Um, so, you know, do you believe in the property? Do you believe in the person that's doing it? Um, you know, I mean, honestly, the, the, the best way is just to go watch that video, because literally it was like 80 minutes where I'd walk someone through if they want to be a passive investor. And there's no pitch. It's just it's honestly me just kind of helping this guy Tim because he's putting in fifty with someone, and he's like Shane, I, I just make a mistake, and so uh, it probably wouldn't do me justice to kind of um, kind of condense it. Yeah, but yeah. certainly, you know, the, the credibility of the person that you're investing with, like, can you pick up the phone? Can you have a conversation with them? Um, and then, do you like the property? Do you like the location? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll link to that too. Make sure you give me a link to that video and I'll make sure I put it below the podcast somewhere in case anyone's watching and wants to go watch that as well. Uh, yeah, but even yeah, yeah. even higher level than that real quick, like if, if they're just, if their head is just in, I want to get into this passively, that's just all I have. 
what do you recommend? Yeah. Do they should they reach out to someone like you? Do they call you? Like, what's the best way to start that process? Yeah, that that um, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily reaching out, uh, <laughs> just because. <laughs> yeah, hundred phone calls. <laughs> yeah, like I, I I don't mind it, right? Yeah. But uh, at the same time, I I think really it's like figuring out what it is that you want mm -hmm. and having kind of realistic expectations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like I've had guys call me and say, hey, Shane, I got $50,000, like, you know, and expecting to double it the next year. It's like, well, like, like if I could do that, like yeah, we would yeah, probably yeah. have this conversation. No, no. <laughs> so I think it's it's kind of understanding yeah. uh, kind of the big picture, which is, is this, a, is this a low risk value add where it's maybe I'm gonna get eight to 12%, is it maybe a little bit higher risk on the development side, which might be 20 to 25 or 50%, um, but just appreciating that and then uh, really making sure that there's a, you know, like I'm, I'm not for everybody, right? right. And I get, and, and that's and that's okay. Um, but uh, I don't do things to, um, j just for shock value. It's just right. like, I, I'm just who I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Grant is who he is and, yeah. All these other guys, like yeah. they, I assume, right? I don't think they're putting on a show because no. it's too difficult. <laughs> no, no. So that's what I mean. Okay. So if, if if these guys are interested in it, I mean, they they gotta do the work. If they're interested, they can't just hop on. There's no there's no easy path to success. Do the work, learn a little bit about it. Make sure yeah. you know what you want, what your plan is before you wait. Because I, I guess at the same time, like we don't want people wasting your time. Like you don't have the time to you know do those soul searching calls. Like you you need people that know what they want, know where they're going, and you're gonna help them get there. Well, okay, so I'll tell you this, like, I mean, and this is kind of uh, one of my motivations for doing my consulting and coaching, if you will, mm -hmm. and that is I've got guys that are being trained by me on how to invest in commercial real estate, but they know that they're not going to do it for the next five or 10 years. They just want to understand it, right. and I'm like, and, and I put out a lot of content for free, but it's like, look, if you want me to train you, then I'm happy to do that. But you just have to understand that there's like an exchange of value, right? And so for me, anyway, that, 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 that's how I do it. So they're learning how to invest properly into a deal. And they may look at it and say, Shane, based on what you've told me, I don't know if I want to be in that deal, right? Um, so that's one way. I mean, you could certainly, if, if you're in a, in a, like, so for you, Darren, right? I mean, you know lots of people in your market. Mm -hmm. If you can go and get someone's attention that has bought and sold 10, 50, $100 million of commercial real estate, go for lunch with them. Yeah. What do you look for? How could I be part of your deals, right? Have those conversations. And uh, some guys will say, you know what? I don't take in outside investors. Or other guys might say, you know what? I like I like you. Uh, you can come in my next deal and I'll tell you when it's, you know. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's multiple different ways that it's going to happen. But that would be, uh, that'd be, that'd be the best way, I think. If you have that personal relationship, start there. Very good. And the last question, I swear I'll let you go after this. Is there, it just popped into my head. Is there any any benefit to possibly someone who wants to get into this actively, but they do have some cash, is there any benefit to starting maybe doing the first deal passive, giving an expert like yourself the capital, writing that deal, learning and getting close to it, and then maybe doing your own in the future as well? Is there any benefit to that or is that just? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, like when you invest in someone else's deal, you're gonna see the, you're going to see the inner workings, right, of how they vetted it, how they financed it, all that kind of paperwork, how it works out, without taking on all the risk, right? Because if, if you're a limited partner, you're not guaranteeing the debt over here. Right. And so you can start to understand it, and I would say that that would be absolutely a good way to uh, – uh, but I would just mention this, Darren. When you're investing, you can ask questions and, and – and, um, try to understand it, mm -hmm. but don't expect that person to train you, right? right? No, 100%. You know, that, that that's, I, I mean, you know, because yeah. they're, they're focused on making the deal happen, exactly. right? They're not, exactly. but, but they'll help you, for sure. Yeah. And a lot of that value is just the exposure. Being around and just seeing it, you gotta be smart enough to learn how to take it in and get what you need Absolutely. out of it. Cool, yeah, man. Yeah. That's really good. I really appreciate the time. That was fantastic. I mean, I think the bottom line here is, Everyone should go get your book if they haven't already because it's a very quick read. It's a lot of value. It gave me a great start, got my wheels turning. Um, I'll Perfect. link your YouTube channel and that video and all that stuff below as well uh, awesome. on the podcast so they can go do that. Is there anywhere else you want to send people or where they can go check you out? 
No, I mean, just, I mean, my website's got everything on it, all the links to YouTube and all that kind of stuff. Cool. So they can check that out, my podcast. And so, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks, Darren. Awesome. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success. <laughs>